Welcome to Behavior Health Today, a Triad production. I'm your host, Dr. Graham Taylor. With me today is a returning guest, Natalie Lieberman, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist and licensed clinical social worker. Natalie has been a faculty member at Jerry Grossman Seminar since 2012 and an adjunct faculty at Pepperdine University Graduate School of Education and Psychology since 2015. In her private practice, Natalie works with an array of clients dealing with substance abuse, trauma, depression, anxiety, relationship issues, career and life transitions, sexual problems, social anxiety disorders, communication issues, self-esteem, and general quality of life issues. In addition to all of this, Natalie's in her second year of her doctoral program studying to become a clinical psychologist while having a full-time private practice in Beverly Hills specializing in trauma and substance abuse. Today, today we're going to be focusing on Natalie's expertise and its exam prep expert and coach and talking about early career experiences and preparing for the social work licensing exam. Natalie, it's so nice to have you back. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me back. I am really psyched to come back and get to talk about such a crucial aspect in our career development. It is a crucial aspect, isn't it? You know, we're going to be talking about exam prep, the uh, national exam for social workers in particular. Let, let, let's just kind of set the framework. When someone is going through their, their, their schooling and their readiness for this, when is someone typically eligible to sit for the licensing exam? Great question. It's a, it's a wonderful opportunity for everybody to kind of get a chance to understand how much work it takes to even qualify to sit for the uh, clinical licensure. Upon graduating from a master level of social work, uh, a candidate would have to complete 3,000 hours, clinical hours. And upon that, they would actually submit an application verifying those experiences. And then in the state of California, Board of Behavioral Sciences and every state has their own version of the board, will approve those hours and have, it will send a notification, in essence, approving and giving the green light to sit for the ASWB, which stands for Association of Social Worker Board, which actually administers four different tests. However, in the state of California, the only exam that will lead to licensure is a clinical examination. And it's right. important to know when somebody is planning and are studying that they know what, which exam they're studying for. Right. That's a good reminder because someone could go down a non-clinical path and learn a number of great skills and everything else, but they don't have that practical piece. So that clinical designation is a good reminder that to sit for licensure, that has to be on their transcript, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And yeah. what I've also kind of inadvertently encountered is that majority of people don't really pause long enough to truly understand right. the implication of the word clinical. Because if you look that, look up the etymology of the word clinical, it literally means by, by patient bedside, mm. which in essence, the test is not really that much invested into testing and regurgitating the knowledge that you've accumulated in your master's program. It truly is an application of skills that you have when you do work with each and individual client that is in front of you. I think that's a, 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 a very important distinction. And it kind of leads into my next question. When you're working with clients in front of you and you're going down this clinical path, people are coming in to see practitioners with a certain expectation. And we as other clinician or clinicians and Practitioners are looking to refer to our colleagues that we know are in good standing and are licensed. So it kind of leads to my question, which I believe is an important one. Why is licensure such an important thing in our field? Well, if you think about any profession, any professional designation, whether it is that you are looking to get a haircut or you're going to get legal advice, we have to have an overseeing agency that whose job is primarily to make certain that they're looking out for the public interest. So in essence, everybody is able to know what the standards are. And it's a watch. It's an agency that in essence oversees our level of competency, our level of education. And also what happens once somebody's licensed. It's not something that learning is ongoing. You actually are supposed to and expected to continue your professional development. 
So the primary goal of a licensing entity is to make certain that there are minimal standards of competence that are being met and there are safeguards in place. So those individuals that perhaps are struggling in their own private life, that public is not going to get the collateral impact of somebody who is struggling and unable to recognize it. That's really good. I think you're right around what the the schooling is that's required for licensure, the hours that are put in required is such that a person's eligible at that time allows for there to be minimal standards met for skill levels to be determined, standards to be created, competency to be assessed, and for there to be a regular regulatory piece of this so that there can be ongoing monitoring to keep our profession safe, such that people coming in to receive help have that certainty that these people are going to be, that they're going to be seeing, are going to be able to meet their needs in a way that they have the expectation around that. So, yeah, I, I think that's such an important piece. You know, why licensure? It is essential for a field, for, for, for a profession, particularly ours, I think, in the mental health profession, which is a very intimate and very vulnerable profession for people to come and seek services from, isn't it? That we want to have those standards where they can feel safe and secure and expectant of um, uh, receiving what they're what they're hoping to receive and needing to receive, and in desperate need of receiving a competent and, yeah, care. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, let's shift a little bit. So, someone's got someone's become eligible for their licensure exam. They've done their coursework. They've done their hours. They filed the paperwork, and and now they get the letter that says you are eligible for your exam. And here's the date that you get to get to take it and sit for it. And it's like, yay! Whoa! At the same time, I think, what are some of the emotions do you find? Because you've done a lot of coaching. You've done with Jerry Grossman. Jerry's just a phenomenal guy. Great program. Great folks like you being a part of it. Uh, but what are some of the emotions you find as people begin to, to, to start preparing for this exam? Coming through the door saying, I'm ready to sit to start, start preparing right now, but I'm also feeling a variety of, of feelings here. What are some of those feelings? I love that you brought in the fact that I really, over the years, I've been doing this for 11 years now, and I have yeah. met people all over in the, in, the, in the scheme of things, in their own personal challenges, in the yeah. level of excitement, that people are very proactive, and quite a few people that are stuck in the mode of avoidance. Yes. Because the exam licensure, uh, licensure process can be very, very daunting and incredibly overwhelming for a lot of people. Everybody has their own unique ability to approach their daily life tasks. Some people are more proactive and they're early birds. They get, even they are interested in getting a head start even before their hours are approved. And some people literally sign up for the course in the 24th hour and they are cramming. Yeah. And some people, I have been very successful with helping somebody. My longest record is somebody who's been trying to pass 10 years, and finally she passed on yes. July 1st. Congrats. I have met people, thank you, that whose English is a second language, and English is my third language, so I uniquely understand that challenge. I have met a lot of individuals that this is their second career. There are some are well in their 60s and 70s that are coming in. Mm -hmm. And they've never been particularly great at exam taking. A lot of individuals that have individual challenges dealing with either learning disabilities mm -hmm. or diagnosable mental health conditions, yes. a lot of anxiety. And that will impact one's ability to oftentimes even show up in life for themselves. And some triggers come about. So if somebody's coming in the first time around, I feel it's kind of easier to set the expectation and to lay the, the law of the land, so to speak, and to tell them, you, in essence, are going to be tested on two and a half years of your graduate school. And this is a competency exam to make certain that you have a really solid overview about very many different aspects. And uh, sometimes people take six years to complete their 3,000 hours. So a lot changes. And what I also say, life gets in the way. So hopefully individuals will really incorporate and understand it is not a sprint, it is a marathon. And approaching it as a marathon and learning to show up and say, what is my ultimate goal? What am I trying to really accomplish? Is this a aspiration that I have had? 
am I switching careers because I have a lot of passion in helping people? Or I'm just learning to start in life and I will ultimately find out once I'm licensed where it is that I'm going to land. You know, you, you've covered so, so many good things in that little pithy part right here. There's excitement. There's also some whoa kind of feelings around this. This is a, this is kind of a gatekeeper for really, when you think about it, you've, 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 you've reached this culmination of your career and now you're going to launch into the next season, but you got to go through this, through this assessment to measure, like you said, the last two years and all the practicum pieces in it. This is a test of base knowledge. That's what this is around to be able to say that you've got the minimal competencies to practice with competence in this field. And there's both excitement and there can be avoidance and avoidance is just fear, isn't it? It's, it's uh, the uncertainty and what we're going to be talking about in just a minute. I think the best antidote for avoidance or procrastination is one, the realization that you're just afraid Two. The best antidote for for procrastination and anxiety is preparation. It begins to, you know, you 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 want to you want to have people go into the test with confidence, but you have to earn confidence. And if we were to reverse engineer that, confidence is developed by first developing a sense of competence or mastery. And if we reverse and we reverse engineer that a little bit more, then we develop mastery and competence by what? By doing right things repeatedly. If we can do the preparation right in good ways, over time, we'll develop mastery and competence. And then someone gets to do what? Earn that confidence. They get to walk into the test. With. So I love the mindset that you're bringing in. If I could also say one other thing, I, I found in then coaching for the test prep that oftentimes people for the very first time, funny enough, come to terms maybe with some things that they hadn't understood before about themselves, like a learning disability Maybe they have ADD and they have trouble focusing on certain things in their preparation process. Maybe they have an anxiety or performance anxiety that comes into kind of a greater appreciation. Uh, sometimes people get to address that for the very first time, don't they? They absolutely do. And oftentimes it takes them two, three, four, five tries. And then they realize that there is That's a right. piece that is missing. That's right. That's right. So you're talking about mindset, being committed. When you have somebody come in, I'm going to talk about tips in just a second. Well, actually, let me let me kind of go into that right now. So if there were some tips for the test takers that you have, whether it's around expectations or boundaries, self-care, talk about some of those things that are essential kind of foundational pillars to put in place as they come into this preparation process here. The very, I always kind of think about, and this is, I always give my, students an option. Do you want to study hard or do you want to study smart? There you go. Because I think it's important to kind of empower people to understand. Some people really don't mind the putting the labor because they say that I have the time. I have a little bit more leisure of time in front of me. So I don't mind studying a little bit more. Majority of people will come in and say, I have a busy life. I have a family. I, I work. I am really excited to start this process, so I'm really curious. What do I do to maximize my efforts into studying smart? Some people come in with pretty decent study habits. Some people I find it very interesting is that the study habits are virtually non-existent, and they've gone through mm -hmm. cramming, and cramming oftentimes is not an outcome that you're going to be happy with. Right. Either because you're going to cram and you're going to, some I have seen have been able to pass the exam by cramming, but unfortunately, once they set their foot out in the real world, they can't really create the impact that our profession is looking for them to create. True. So when somebody is coming in, it really is about understanding how do I have the shift in the mindset that I'm able to truly start by saying, I need to have patience. I need to have consistency and I have to create a plan that works for me. Mm -hmm. We talked about most people would say that there is a learning preference. Science actually now is telling us more and more. There is no such a thing as a learning style. I personally, in my experience, don't necessarily agree with this just based on my own unique lifestyle preferences, but nevertheless, it would be incredibly helpful for individuals to understand where their preferences are. And at the end of the day, you can really 
magnify the impact of studying by incorporating as many of these learning preferences or differences that we actually naturally gravitate towards. Nellie, I would, I would love our listeners to hear a little bit more about this. I know there are some resources that you have around this theme of preferences, approaches, and a process that we can build into the study process that makes our studying smarter, it enhances our gains, and it allows us to be more successful on the exam itself. For you listeners that don't know, um, Natalie is from Kiev, and as she said, English is her third language. Phenomenal. And she's uh, done so many things academically, and, and as we're talking about professionally and also in the test prep area. But you, uh, from your schooling, from your learning process, you have an experience around ways that those that are preparing for the exam can actually enhance their learning process. Would you tell us about some of those strategies and maybe those three resources that uh, you have kind of in your back pocket there? Absolutely. A lot of the resources that I had created for myself, because I, I came to United States as an adult and I had to learn English as an adult. And um, I had a big road ahead of me. So being in the United States for seven years, having two children under the age of three, I graduated from UCLA, summa cum laude. So everybody needed to study the material. I had to learn the language first. And what made me so very successful is that I understood the various components, how you can really capitalize on various modalities to learn. A lot of people are more visually oriented. And if that is your preference, it basically means that you want to utilize as many visual, as many graphs, as many things that your mind is able to place in the context. Even using things like studying Freudian defense mechanisms, you're able to find images that will solidify. If somebody's in denial, for example, you will see that this is a person in essence being an ostrich. They're burying their head in the sand. If somebody is a lot more auditory, it means that they really are holding on and reconciling information by the way of connecting it on an auditory level. A lot of people are very kinesthetic and not even certain what that really truly means. It means that you connect information by writing things out, by role playing. Yes. Um, everybody has a preference in a sense, do you want to study by yourself or do you better studying in the group? For me personally, I've never done well studying with other people. I, this is just the way I've, I've done it all of my life. So understanding it, some people are very verbal or linguistically inclined, which means that by actually hearing you speak or even recording audios, you're able to reconcile and to foster an ability to download things into your long-term memory. So one of the things that you can kind of incorporate all of those styles is by creating your own flashcards. I personally really, really like the app. It's called Anki, A-N-K-I. It's an app. You get to create your own flashcards. But what makes that particular app so special is that you actually get to rate the difficulty, how easy, medium, or difficult is it for you to retain the information. And depending on how much repetition you need, the app will shuffle the repetitiveness of the information that you're trying to learn. So for example, the the clinical exam is only counting on about 10% of you recalling information. But nevertheless, it is a very safety-oriented test, which means there are like a, a lot of psychotropic medications that we actually need to learn. And a couple of them have to do with safety, knowing that if the person is taking an older class of antidepressive medication, we got to be aware that there are some dietary limitations. And if you don't know the name of that medication, you're likely to miss a point and it can actually make a difference whether you're going to pass exam or you're not going to pass exam. So you can actually incorporate by creating it, you're engaging your visual, you can have them played back. And then it's really stimulating your ability to go back and retrieve the information that you're trying to learn. 
Really good. I, I love that idea of the app and being able to have it shuffled around your strengths and the repetitive nature of the flashcards you're doing well on and maybe those that aren't being done uh, quite to, to the level you'd like them to be. What's another resource you might, I think you mentioned a book before regarding Make It Stick. There is a wonderful book that is all based on the science of learning. We know that in the last 10, 20 years, the field of uh, neuroscience and neuroplasticity has really created such a magnificent impact on what we do and how much we drive and have agency of our own neuroplasticity. So there is a book that's called Make It Stick, and it's a book uh, specifically that talks about how do you really study. It is a, it is a book that is a science of successful learning. Really good. Really good. You know, what I love about this is that, you know, oftentimes we'll come at the licensing exam like we did other exams during our academic career. But the licensing exam, this is a whole nother beast. This is a whole different test. And the idea of cramming or just kind of doing some flashcards here, there, kind of studying this domain and that domain, it doesn't work on this exam. It's it's too grand. When I was doing some coaching with a with a EPPP for psychology, there's about 860, 900, let's say, key terms that you have to know very thoroughly. That's a lot. Out of that, they take about 200, 250 for the exam itself. But you have to really master that 900, the, the, those 900 key terms. That's a lot of work. So cramming. It doesn't work. You might get lucky, but very few do. So you're encouraging, what if we took this content and we applied to it a, a, a learning process that's based in research that's going to enhance the encoding of material, it's going to enhance the retention of material, it's going to enhance the ability to recall it when you need it. You're saying, let's go with a plan and let's enhance what we can do, but let's do it strategically. Absolutely. That is exactly what I'm saying. And I, what my experience has been is that majority of individuals in the United States of America, number one, have never been given tools how to study. Yes. You show up, you listen for lecture, and then they give you multiple choice options. The part of the world I come from, that was never an option. We, all of our testing were done either in the oral presentation or essay. So in essence, I came in with a very robust difference of how information is retained and what I've learned. And I'm guilty of it myself, of highlighting. Mm -hmm. It turns out highlighting is not really helpful at all. And yet we all have done it. Mm -hmm. So they believe it or not, there have been quite a few empirically based studies. People study what's effective and they call it a low utility or a high utility, where you basically, how you study is going to give you the most rewards and benefits. So when you think of a study, think about a passive learning as opposed to active learning. What is the major difference? When you think about a passive learning, it's basically when you're rereading either your notes or you're rereading the textbook, which in essence, some of it might be helpful, but it's not the most impactful in the way of you retaining information. It's less effective. Another aspect that is also known as passive is highlighting. Highlighting can only work to boost your confidence, or in essence, it might give us a little bit of a safety blanket. Mm -hmm. It's allowing us to pause long enough, to literally highlight the component, but it doesn't provide for reconciliation in a long-term memory. And the third one is summarizing or making notes. Yes. When you are doing it by virtue of copying it from one page to the next, that actually constitutes passive learning. So what do we do? It will help you. Obviously, we've gotten through a master's degree. Majority of us have utilized those resources. But now these, the stakes are a lot higher. It's a lot higher in the sense that a lot of people will either get a promotion. Some people will actually have to be demoted because they're not licensed within a certain period of time. And a lot of it having to do with triggers that people most of the time were not aware of. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? We can actually use evidence-based practice tips that will truly allow somebody to almost increase their studying to the point that it becomes on steroids. How do we do that? 
there are two most important skills that everybody can, and in my opinion, should very successfully incorporate. Number one is an active recall or retrieval, Mm -hmm. which is the most important and the most impactful way. Because what we do know is that we learn more by getting stuff out of our brain as opposed to putting stuff in our brain. Mm So by you having to tap in into the area of your brain to retrieve information, this is actually when the information sticks. And how do we do that? We can actually, even writing notes, whatever you read, close the book and make notes based upon what you remember. Just using that minor little tweak is really going to allow us to start regurgitating information in our own way. Right. And that parlays into recallability on the test. And most importantly, how do we apply what we know? So that's people, the first one. The yes, se- go. Yeah, go. The second one is going to be to have spaced repetition. It's almost counterintuitive, but it's going to be a lot more impactful if you're going to repeat something not incessantly when you allocate two hours and you do it over and over again, but to review it and to mark in your calendar somewhere that you're going to go back and do it again. Why? Because what we do, what we have in science is called the forgetting curve. And the more you're able to space it out, the more you're interfering with the forgetting curve, which means that Spreading, reviewing material over time is going to be a lot more impactful. For example, if you're ever wanting to learn, whether it was a language or a musical instrument, doing it consistently 10 minutes a day is going to have far more benefits than doing it one hour on Saturday. Mm -hmm. So these are very, very practical and concrete tools that people can incorporate and becoming very strategic about it. We all have been able to utilize the technology. I always think that there are four areas on the test and each content area for the LCSW exam has a lot of content. There is a lot of competency area. So creating a spreadsheet, literally opening up an Excel and creating four different tabs at the bottom and understanding, for example, that let's say you struggle with diagnoses. How are you going to structure your studying that today's Thursday, let's say, I'm going to review DSM-5 for an hour, and then I'm going to put it on my schedule to do exactly the same thing a week from today, and then a month from today, depending on how much time people have and what their timeline for the exam. Having a system in place, and you'd rather learn something a little bit every day as opposed Mm -hmm. to cramming. And we actually reviewed material that how people are successful athletes are being trained. So what they do is there's a lot of switching. You'd rather switch gears instead of sitting down and studying medication for the the next two hours. You wanna study medication for 15 minutes and then perhaps switch to ethics. That is going to keep your brain being active and also avoid having some fatigue, just study fatigue. Really good. You know, I loved you said something quickly. I'm not sure everybody heard it, but I, I I caught it. It was, we have an opportunity to study, but we have an opportunity to study on steroids. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> this idea. Why, why why not? Why why not? Why not build these things in? Things like, uh, you know, space learning, kind of scaffolded learning. We we know uh, small small bite sized pieces over time versus one big chunk is a far better way to encode that material and to be able to retain it and recall it. You're talking about recall practice, kind of really thinking about what you've learned and trying to draw that out far better than trying to just stuff it in. And then you're talking about scheduling and being intentional about laying out what your study process is going to be. We do that in every area of our lives. We schedule patients, we schedule meetings, we schedule everything else, but we don't oftentimes schedule out our preparation process. Why not do that too? So we have a kind of a roadmap, a little GPS you know, format here, what we're going to be doing each and every day so we can kind of track our process. You also have talked about, Natalie, and I I think this is a real important thing. We're talking about the external things that we can do to enhance our internal learning process. But how about things like mindset 
or fully committing, I mean, fully being in, building an accountability, uh, maybe some boundaries that people might need to set in their lives in order to carve out time and prioritize self-care. Talk about some of those pieces that enhance this learning process and this preparation time. Oh, I love this question, uh, Graham. And one of the things is that oftentimes what I see is that people in mental health profession have a tendency to be incredibly giving of themselves, but oftentimes they kind of lack uh, applying the same tools to themselves. This is going to be a marathon. Mm -hmm. I cannot stress the importance of keeping sleep hygiene we know that one of the most important, and I call it a non-negotiable element of reconciliation things we learn into long-term memory is our sleep. And we all have a tendency to undermine the importance of sleeping, importance mm -hmm. of having a schedule. And like you said, we have to be able to schedule things and put it our, on our calendar. So having a structure, I always talk to my clients and to my students about importance of self-care. This is supposed to be not a punishment. It actually tends to be a very enjoyable experience. If you mm -hmm. set the goal, you set the boundaries and you create the mindset, what does that look like? You gotta be able to give yourself a realistic timeline. I think anybody that is trying to study for this test in less than six weeks is doing themselves a great disservice. Absolutely. In my opinion, it is essential to take one day off a week of not studying at all because you're going to start resenting this process. You have to have something to look forward to. And I'm a really, really big component of studying for an hour or two at the most, five days a week, mm -hmm. and taking four-hour chunks once a week so you can actually condition your body and condition your mind for a four-hour exam that most people are going to have to take. And the reason why I'm saying most is that some individuals that have either psychological, emotional, or physical challenges, they qualify for special accommodations. Mm -hmm. So what's for most people are four hours. I have had some students that are given six hours. So you have to have the endurance to be able to be as sharp during hour four as you would be during hour one. So what are the things that are completely within our control? Keeping a hygiene schedule, making certain that you sleep at least seven and a half, or preferably eight hours a day. The practice of meditation, where you're able to slow your thoughts because we have a nonstop radio, what it's called. And oftentimes our, our thoughts sabotage our ability to show up confidently. Also, the importance of not studying when your mind hasn't been fed the right ingredients. It's not a good idea for you to have a Kit Kat or a Snicker bar as you're going to study because you're going to have a sugar crash. Obviously, I'm not a dietitian. I'm not allowed to give dietary advice. But I think by now we all know that the success is not to create a sugar rush. And after that, you crash and burn. Making certain that if you live with family, you kind of get everybody in the room and you say, look, this is important. This is not something that is easy to conquer by myself. I need your support. Do I have a commitment with everybody that these are the hours that I'm going to have to dedicate? And by the way, I know that I have a tendency to slack off. Can one of you be my accountability body? Really good. And everybody... And everybody ultimately needs to understand where their shortcomings are because mm -hmm. everybody has them. And if you're aware of them and you step in instead of hiding and avoiding and saying, look, I know that I will do better if somebody is going to keep me accountable or some people are going to feel too controlled and it's going to have the opposite impact. I know you encourage folks uh, to study with the most recent materials that kind of goes without saying things change, something in the DSM-5 might change or some new research coming into play that people are going to be tested on. So in addition to studying with the most recent materials, that's usually from the test prep companies that keep abreast of any changes in the fields. You also, uh, and part of what we talked about in the introduction was, is as a coach, you encourage workshops, you encourage uh, people that are studying to plug themselves into a coaching relationship, uh, which they have access to typically through their membership. 
to be supported through, to be accountable to, and to just have someone to really know that's in their corner. Talk about the importance and the benefit of getting a coach that's trained in this area, like yourself, to help somebody through this process. I really love the idea of maximizing the resources that we have. It really makes no difference what your learning preferences are. I can tell you that every single person will benefit from a live workshop interaction mm -hmm. where you hear information and somebody has an opportunity to raise their hand, even on Zoom, and to say, this doesn't make sense. Would you be able to give me an example? Outside of attending a real live workshop, the most important thing that individuals that are studying for the exam can do and should do is to take as many practice exams as possible. As far as getting a coach, everything in life is going to be an expense. Either it's an expense of time or it's an expense of money. Right. And everybody gets to kind of figure out where they have a little bit more wiggle room. One of the benefits of coaching is that somebody like me, who has been studying intensely for the last 15 years, every day, every week, I learn new things. I, I show up not just to give you information pertaining to something you can read on, the, on your own. I have a lot of experience academic in combined with treating a lot of clients. So I show up and I basically give you an ability to shorten your path to licensure because I'm able to explain things in a way that is not recited from the book, but in a way that I'm able to merge information from academia into practicality. And a lot of times, uh, and there are also a lot of tricks along the way. This test, like any standardized test, there is a whole science behind how these exams are constructed. That's right. And I've never had to take a standardized test until I showed up for licensure. And when I started teaching at Pepperdine and I recognized that this is a whole field and you would not necessarily have even known that. And even a lot of students that had to take SAT test or GRE test, they've forgotten the skills that they were taught because oftentimes it's not something that people do. And another component that I'm encountering a lot. People real life job experiences actually tends to be a hindrance for somebody who's taking the test. Yeah, these are all great reminders, things that we don't naturally think about, but are uh, in, <laughs> involved in all this preparation and mindset, et cetera. You know, I, uh, what you're saying here too, I want to kind of highlight, it's important, I believe, you know, in terms of a sense of readiness, people sometimes say, well, I'll, I'll set the date for my test when I feel ready you're never gonna feel fully ready. So don't do that. Instead, set a date when you wanna sit for this exam. It, there's, a, there's a good urgency around that and allows you and your coach, ideally you're gonna sign up to have a relationship with one to really work towards kind of like an end of a semester date that we have. And we all work great and we're all work better with a healthy kind of angst kind of keeps us in the zone kind of keeps us at a, a good level of arousal. We look and think about Yerkes Dodson's model of arousal not having a date, having a date too close, too much pressure, not enough energy, but something right, just right at the top can allow us to prepare in really healthy and planned ways. So uh, I want to talk about, we're kind of, kind of coming into the home base here, but you're talking about one of the ways to know kind of what your level of mastery is, taking the tests, great reminder in those tests are the main content you're going to have to master. So we got the written content, you've got the testing questions to really complement each other as someone learns and, and some really good content and content learning comes out of reviewing those tests. As we come to a close, let's, let's just say someone's done the best they could. And for whatever reason, they don't pass. How do you first help them deal with the mindset around that? And then what are the next steps that you encourage them to take? There is a certain level of having to grieve. So people that have not been successful, candidates that haven't been successful, they really go through DAPTA, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and finally they come to acceptance. Sometimes people are able to accomplish all of that within an hour, and sometimes people need a little bit more longer time to really kind of understand the gravity of the situation. 
I, everything in life happens for a reason. And sometimes we can't really see the reason. And sometimes we don't understand it and it feels unjust. But at the end of the day, everything is a learning experience. Mm-hmm. It's an opportunity for us to reflect, to take stock. And I always say, look, consider that you've done your research. Now you've gone in and you've kind of taken stock of what the testing center is like. What is the computer like? You know how to navigate and setting in and managing your anxiety. What happened? I want to know what happened. Did you run out of time? Did you mm-hmm. blank out? Sometimes I hear students have a lot of anxiety and somebody recommends to them to take over-the-counter medication to get a good night's sleep and they space out. It's important to be more of a detective and to find out what had happened on the exam. Sometimes people feel like they can go on and be a superhero, but then they realize in the past week, somebody gotten super sick or they had too much on their plate or they didn't sleep. So understanding truly is that because you can really take an honest stock of I'm really lacking on the content. My knowledge base is not as robust or something has gone wrong with my approach on the exam. I brought in everything that I do at work, or I didn't pay attention to what the question was. Understanding what had happened is really going to allow us to create a roadmap. Because if you think about it, individuals that haven't been successful are able to repeat the test every 90 days. I always recommend my students to take at least two weeks off to recalibrate, to kind of go out there and to say, okay, I had the first go of it. I haven't gotten, haven't gotten the results I wanted. Let me just make certain that I give myself a treat for putting mm-hmm. in an effort. And then you recalibrate and you say, this had what worked. I could have done this a little bit more. Or I understand that I'm not really an auditory person. And I've been studying primarily listening to audio. Mm-hmm. And I recognize that I missed an opportunity to truly learn and to sit down and understand what is this test? ultimately teaching me what am I finding out about myself because more than anything else it's really not a failure it's more of a of a test for our own ability to recognize what do we learn from the experience because we're going to have clients that are going to come in and they will have setbacks so now you have an ability to kind of vouch that I know what it's like to not be successful in something and I have to recalibrate and I have to pick myself up not in the way that I feel sorry by myself for myself, but in the way that I'm going to, it's going to make me stronger. Yeah. Really good. You know, I tend to think in times like this and in the way you're responding, we're either winning or we're learning. (laughs) So if someone doesn't pass the exam, we get to say, well, okay, so this is a sad thing. We get to mourn and grieve that you're also talking about, we get to kind of right size, you know, what this not having passed means. Then you're talking about, well, let's let's take a little bit of time, recalibrate, and let's talk about then how we're going to create a new study plan based on what you did last time and your experience of the exam and your experience of yourself in the exam. And let's set ourselves back up for success in this next round of preparation. So you really right size in a way that says, let's get back on the horse and let's do some right things here. Natalie, I know we're kind of winding down on our time today, but I would love folks to be able to uh, find out more about you, your coaching, your test prep expertise, and what you're doing. Give us uh, some resources that people can follow up after listening to the show today to get in touch and find out more about you. I am currently on Instagram. I haven't had a chance to create a website yet because I've been so incredibly busy, <laughs> but it's very easy to get a hold of me on Instagram. My office used to be in, in West Hollywood. Okay. So my Instagram page is W E. H-O, therapist. And it stands for weho, therapist at gmail.com. That's my email or my Instagram is weho, therapist. Awesome. Very, very good. Also, we have uh, through the triad uh, uh, organization, we have the Jerry Grossman seminars uh, that folks can get in touch with. There's get connect with coaches there as well and uh, get some awesome, awesome study material, test uh, questions, And uh, some really great opportunities to really master this contest. You can walk into that exam that uh, you've earned to walk into and to feel confident as you do with some great mastery and preparation under your belt. So, Natalie, I want to welcome you uh, back to our show again today and to thank you for being back on our show again today. I want to welcome you again maybe next time for our third show together. We'll find a topic and look forward to hearing what you continue to do. So welcome back today and thanks for being with us. 
and I look forward to our time again next time. Thank you very much for having me. It's been an honor to be back. Been nice to have you. I also want to thank you, our listeners, for joining Natalie and me today. It's always great to have you with us. Regarding this episode today, I want to remind you that it and its resources and all of our other shows can be found on our webpage at triadhq.com slash BHT. So check out our webpage, triadhq.com slash BHT, and explore our archive of uh, resources, podcasts, and other resource materials. Thanks again for being with us on the show. I look forward to having you back with us next time on Behavior Health Today.